Um, all right. So this is going to be chapter 10 of uh, this book that we spent a bit of time with now. Um, all right. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, oh, CNNs. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, you'll notice the, the date is from a long time ago now. So I hope I, uh, <laughs> I hope this goes all right. Uh, yeah, CNN. I don't know if, oh, never mind. Uh, it happens to also be the name of a news network in the United States. Uh, and well, globally. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I figured I should probably, you know, do at least a little chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now that the chuckle is done. Um, so, okay. So CNNs are convolutional neural networks. Uh, that's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to be using the same data as before, which now that that's been many moons ago. Um, by the way, Moon Knight, good series. I recommend it. Uh, anyway, uh, many moons ago, we were working with this Kickstarter data. Again, where the, the predictor is, of course, text, because that's what this book is about. But it specifically comes from the blurb describing a Kickstarter proposal that people can either fund or not. And what we're predicting, so the problem is also the same. It's a binary class classification problem uh, where we are predicting whether or not the Kickstarter was successful or whether it failed. Um, so I'm going to scroll past this. This is the same code I just copy and pasted from previous, um, uh, from the I had chapter eight was densely connected neural networks. And um, I went and got the most recent data just to compare my results with the results that are presented in the book. Uh, so that's why I have to do some um, stuff. Uh, so just to make it in the same format that they have it. Um, and with that, we can begin, or I'll begin. So um, I, I'm not sure actually if this chapter is is done in the book. Um, the the description of convolutional neural networks is pretty sparse, um, just like a document term matrix. I'm just going to throw out all the jokes. Pretty sparse, um, but I I think it's more than like 0.1 percent done. So. Uh, or one percent done. Um, so okay, so they're they're um, very, I guess, hu heuristic understanding. Well, the, the the understanding of CNNs that they want to provide us is that they can learn, and then I have in quotes here, local spatial structures within data, and so that's juxtaposed to, I guess, first the densely connected neural networks, which uh, don't look at um, don't consider the sort of spatial relationships between words. And then they also juxtapose it to the uh, long short-term memory uh, models that can look at very long, uh, long range text dependencies. So, so we're looking at the sort of basically like embeddings uh, or the ingrams actually would be a better way to put it kind of ish. Okay, so what are convolutional neural networks? Well, the first answer that might not be helpful is just a neural network that has convolutional layers. Um, and so this, uh, all the images here, and again, I, I think the book isn't finished because the images don't render in, in, their, uh, in, in, their get, in their site. So all the images are gonna come from the ISLR book where ISLR is, Introduction to Statistical Learning in R. Um, so, and there's a book club for that. Uh, actually, I think there are a lot of book clubs for that. It's the hot book club these days in R40S. Which um, one? The ISLR. Oh. I think there are like four or five book clubs for that going right now. So it's pretty wild. Um, so any anyway, um, so here, and, and this is actually, there, there are a couple of things to note about this uh, description of an architecture. It is first the input 
is an image, and that is by far the canonical um, data type or the use case of a CNN is image classification. Um, they're almost treated as synonymous. Um, not not synonymous, but uh, they go they go together like like peanut butter and jelly. Um, so basically, what would happen is you would pass an image to your your neural network, and the first thing that would happen is this convolution. This convolutional filter would go over your image, extract a bunch of um, a bunch of layers, and then you do this thing called pooling, which we'll talk about, and then you can convolve again, and then you can pool again, and then you can convolve again, you can pool again. So here there are three convolutional layers, each of which is followed by a pooling layer, then there's a flattening, and then and here there's, uh, I believe, a hundred case, or sorry, a hundred classes that can be classified, that images can be classified into. Um, okay, so let's say a, a convolutional neural network, but we'll go into the details in a second. Uh, and so the idea is that in these convolutional layers that give CNNs their name, uh, a filter will slide over the data. And I'll talk about that. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. No, um, I'm not on mute. Sorry. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just go over. And so I'll, I'll keep going through. Uh, okay, so the, the main thing that goes on in this convolutional operation is the passing of a kernel over the pixels of the image, or in our case, the uh, words in a, in a text. So here's how they describe it. The kernel is a small vector that slides along the input. When it is sliding, it performs element-wise multiplication of the values in the input and its own weights, and then sums up the values to get a single value. All right, now that's quite a bit, I think. So again, uh, going from the, the ISLR book, they have this nice example uh, to show you what the operation is that is described here in words. Uh, so if we have an image where the values we're just going to represent going down alphabetically, so it's got a we go three by four, or sorry, a four by three uh, matrix, and we've got this convolution filter which is uh, fancy, so it has Greek letters, and what we do is we, you can imagine taking this convolution, convolution filter and putting it over A, B, D, E, and then that'll be one pass. And then you'll put it over B, C, E, F. And then you go down, you put it over D, E, G, H, and so on. You, you go down the image. And what you do is, so I'll, I'll just show you this. So this is not the result yet, but as I was typing this out in, in LaTeX, um, I realize that this is actually kind of useful. So you, you'll see what we end up doing is we have, here we have a three by two matrix. And the reason that it has that shape is because you'll notice that it can go in the first row, it can go A, B, D, E, and it can go B, C, E, F. And that's as far as it can go horizontally. So that's why we have in our result the resulting feature map, we've got two rows. And why is it, sorry, we have two columns. Why does it have, three rows, well, because we can do A, B, D, E, that's one row, we can do D, E, G, H, that's another, and we can do G, H, J, K. So that's three rows. Is this what's called um, a linear kernel? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I've no, I haven't seen it referred to it. I mean, so this is a linear operation. We're actually just taking a dot product. Right. I haven't, and it, it is also, this convolutional filter is also called uh, a kernel. So I'm going to, in fact, the section is called a kernel, but it can be called a filter as well. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that because I like in this book that I'm reading through, it's called a filter. And I was like, oh God, this, I don't like all these terms. But in papers I've been reading recently, they're not, uh, actually, they do. They, it's a last one was a BioSTM CNN architecture and they keep mentioning this like linear kernel model and balanced classes and I was like is there any other kernel is there any kind of kernel there, there are other kernels I, I don't think they're I don't think they would be used in this case I know they're Gaussian kernels and yeah but, but I don't think they're not used NLP? Here. At least, at least for a, a convolutional neural network doing the convolution, 
um, you know, I'm not an expert, but uh, I have read various sources and I've never seen anything other than what's current, than what's described in this book for this part. All right, you you go you go hunt that down. I'll uh, I'll try to figure this out. So um, so the resulting feature map in the end is is this. So we have you know I'm not going to read out all these, but we would um, again it's the two by two convolution filter with an element wise multiplication in addition of the uh, the original image. So so that's what we get. So we get this resulting feature map that is three by two. Um, so these are basically dot products. Um, and so um, the, the parameters here, the, the Greek letters, are, the, um, are, what, are what is trained in a, a neural network. So those are the weights that we've been talking about uh, since we've been talking about um, deep learning. And there's an optional bias term, but it, um, it's really a default. So I actually went ahead and included it, even though it wasn't in the original images. So plus, there'll be a bias term for each uh, each filter. I guess I can put that. Oh no, that was a, I should not do not try to change. Uh, <laughs> do not do not try to mess with LaTeX in this uh, whatever it's called mode in our studio. I don't recommend that. Um, anyway, but so the convolutional filter should probably have the plus bias here, but um, I didn't do that. Okay, so. Um, basically what, what happens, I apologize, this is a terrifying image. Um, but what happens is that these um, filters at, at early levels, you can think of as detecting features. So they're, they're feature detection or feature extraction, right? Or feature creation, you can think of just features. Um, and so basically you might have a, a filter that and again, in the, the visual case, which again is the primary application of CNNs, you might have one that detects vertical lines, right? And so notice that uh, hopefully it, it comes out, and I can zoom in a little bit. No, I cannot zoom in. Um, or I could zoom in if I were capable. Um, but um, so notice, for example, that in the upper black and white image of, uh, of this fierce little dude, um, the vertical lines are much more stark than, for example, in the bottom image. Uh, and you can see that kind of on this side, the, the black fur on the side of his face. Whereas, for example, uh, this horizontal detecting kernel filter, um, it, it actually kind of brings out the whiskers a little bit. You can see the whiskers, which are really not present in the, in the, in the one above. So, so, so that's the idea, is that we're at the first level, um, kernels are going to detect um, features, but, but they're going to learn the features. So, so no one said, no one said like, there's going to be a kernel for detecting vertical lines. It's just that if you train these models, that's what they will end up doing. Okay, so there's that. Um, kernel size. So um, you might wonder like why this convolutional filter is two by two. That's a hyperparameter. So that is not learned from the data. Uh, that's a hyperparameter that the researcher sets. Um, but one thing that's worth pointing out is that they're usually, they're squares. Like that is, you would have to work hard to make uh, a kernel not a square, um, at least in, in the vision case. Um, and, and so they're usually just defined by one number, which is the length of one side of the square, which becomes, you know, because it's a square, it's the length of all sides of the square. So that's why you just need one number to determine how big a kernel is. And, and it's, in, it's in pixels, I guess, is the, the unit you would think of it here. For us, it's going to be uh, tokens. But in the visual case, it's pixels. Um, and, again, and again, going back finally to the text application that is our application, um, the way that they're urging us to think of it is as uh, an ingram, basically. So, so there's that. So there's, I think, the very there's like kind of some rough ideas about convolutional neural networks. Uh, and now we can start looking at how this happens in, in Keras, in TensorFlow, in R, all this. So, okay. So I'm trying to think how much to go into the syntax. Um, we're gonna be using the 
sequential API, which is the, the I, I don't, you know, it'll be interesting. I don't know in, in industry how much people tend to use sequential versus functional, but sequential is always like presented first as if, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's training wheels or if it's just a higher level, easier to use uh, way of creating a neural network. In any case, um, we're gonna be embedding our words into um, 16 dimensional vectors, dense vectors. Again, that was a topic for, uh, from a previous chapter. Um, and then now this is the, the, these two layers are the, the, the new layers. Um, so we have a, oops, we have a uh, one dimensional convolution. So that's gonna be basically a sliding filter that is, is, is not, it's not like a, it's not picking up squares in an image, right? It's picking, it's going along a text, right? Which a text is a one dimensional sequence of words. So that's why it's a one dimensional uh, filter. Um, and so, so we're actually gonna train 32 filters, which is uh, pretty wild. And I'll go back to an image to show, to give it like a visualization of what that means. And the kernel size is five. So it's actually gonna be looking at uh, adjacent sequences of five tokens. And then it's gonna use a ReLU activation function. Okay, so that's what we need to describe that. And then um, just real quick, um, it's gonna use max pooling. So basically it's gonna look at the values, the, the five values, and just kind of get a more granular representation by just taking out the max value to reduce ultimately the number of parameters. But okay, so what does this um, 32 filters mean? So notice here that they took one, you know, we'll say this was a two by two box and this picture of uh, this fierce little feline. Uh, and it was expanded into one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So there, what they did was they had six different filters go over that same space. I mean, but over all this, it will end up being over all the spaces. But so, so this would have, this would be six filters here. Um, and so ours are gonna be, is, is our while we have, we're gonna have 32, 32 filters. Um, so that's quite a bit. And just to be clear again, these are like the individual filters. Uh, again, but it was, we're, I'm going back and forth between the visual and the text. Um, but the idea is, of course, you don't want more than one. Like if you only had one filter and it was just detecting vertical lines, then you're losing a bunch of other information. So you want a bunch of, I mean, you definitely want more than two or so, but uh, we're going all out, we're going 32. Um, and yeah, that's, but it is a hyperparameter as is kernel size as is the activation function. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, that's the, the most basic, these are the most basic functions that are, we're gonna need to constitute the model. And then we're gonna use densely connected layers um, later. And um, because it's a binary classification problem, we have a one unit at the end that has a sigmoid activation function. So we're gonna be outputting, uh, well, with the right transformation, we'll be outputting probabilities. Um, okay, so I'm trying to think how much of this to go over. Um, well, we can actually, I can run this real quick. Um, hopefully, I can run this real quick. Let's see. Ta -da. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. All right, well, maybe, I don't know if I'll be able to show how much output I'll be able to show. Let's see if, okay, nice. Um, so here, this is uh, unfortunate um, the way spacing happens. I don't know why the side margins are so huge. Hmm, that's a bit sad. That's probably a way to change that. Um, in any case, uh, like most neural networks, uh, I mean, this is relatively modest, but this, has a lot of parameters. If you're used to things with like number of parameters, like in the tens, you know, nice 300, basically 325,000. Um, so uh, one of the things that they don't cover in the book is like, what are all these uh, parameters? Um, like, like what is, where does this number come from? So the 25,092, 
this actually took me a little, I had to like try to decompose it various ways. And I, I figured it out. And I was, so I'll share that, so I'll share that uh, small victory with you. Um, okay, so the, the convolutional layer, um, you know, putting it in there is gonna require us to train, to fit, uh, to determine basically 2,600 weights. And so the exact, the way we get that is that, so we had 32 filters, so we can, you know, divide that by 32, it gives us 81. Okay, so that implies, you know, that each of the 32 filters has 81, 81 weights in each filter. Um, and where do those come from? So that comes from what we determined was our kernel length of five, the hyperparameter we set. And we also had 16 embedding dimensions. Um, and so really what the kernel is doing, and this is something that, that I, I can't believe they didn't include in the book, because uh, this is not at all something that you can just intuit. Um, but so what, what the kernel is doing in, the, in this case, in, a, in our language case, is sliding along uh, like five tokens at a time, whatever unit our, uh, our text is broken up into. And for each one of those, it's using simultaneously, and I mean, this makes sense, all 16 dimensions of the, uh, all 16 dimensions of the meaning, right? Because the word is represented as a 16 dimensional, the, word, the word's meaning is uh, represented as a 16 dimensional vector. So anyway, that turns out to be 80, and we add one bias term, uh, which is just an intercept, and take it 81. So anyway, that's where that's where that number comes from. Okay, um, and then there's pooling, and then the stuff is the same as before. Um, and yeah, I mean, and and so with this, we're not going to be super interested in the performance of this model because it's just the introductory model. I mean, you could think of it as a baseline baseline model. Um, so I fit it, I fit it earlier. I'm not gonna do this again. It'll take a, takes a while to run, um, but we can in the end, I guess, actually look at this. We can look at the metrics. Um, so this is validation results. Um, and then we have these different uh, measures. So we get a 78% accuracy. Um, and then, you know, and ROC, I mean, they're, they're, they're decent numbers. Um, although you'll find that people in uh, in this community, I mean, okay, for each application, you know, what counts as uh, a good model is, what counts as a good accuracy uh, varies a lot. And so, um, in any case, uh, in, in their application, I just, as a note, they got 81% and then they got an ROC AUC of 86 and it's different data. Um, I think it's about the same amount of data this is not like an order of magnitude different. So this is kind of a sad decrease um, because another thing to mention is that you will see people talk about like a one percentage point increase in, in accuracy, for example, as like a huge difference in neural network time, like talk, which is uh, very, it's something that I'm not used to. Um, so anyway, there's that. Um, and just as before, there are different, um, there are different ways to visualize this again, but these visualizations aren't like unique to uh, convolutional neural networks or no neural networks at all. This is just a confusion matrix and this is just an ROC curve. So uh, not, not super interesting there, but they're available. Okay, so uh, that was just one convolutional layer, but again, to give everyone motion sickness and scroll back up, uh, notice that for example, in the uh, ISLR book, they just, their sample, their, their, their model they wanted to illustrate the architecture with had three levels, sorry, three layers, three convolutional layers. So, um, so we can look at that. Um, and so basically I wrote a complexifying, I'm gonna add this to the dictionary, probably not good for the future, but um, all right. So when we wanna make our CNNs more complex, uh, we have, to spell two correctly, we have two options. Um, so we can learn more local patterns with more convolutional filters, or the idea would be to learn more global features by having more dense layers. So notice that opposition there. If you wanna learn more spatial features, uh, you would have convolutional layers. This is, and then if you wanna like 
see how they interact with, with each other, you would use dense layers. Um, and in the book, they recommend starting Wait, simple. Can you repeat that last, the last thing you said? What it... Yeah, so, so the, the juxtaposition is that if you want to learn about the sort of spatial structure, uh, if you want to like detect objects, create features, um, you'll want to use, you'll want to add more convolutional layers. Um, whereas if you want to see how they sort of globally combine to create something, uh, you know, like a classification, uh, in that case, you would add a densely connected layer. Okay. So that's why in the last example, there were two dense layers, the sigmoid and the ReLU. So, so there's actually only one dense, there's only one like optional dense layer um, because you every model that we have is going to have this, this last, well, it's going to have this last dense layer because you just need a densely connected layer with one unit that it has a sigmoid activation function if we're doing this application. Yeah, if we're doing the binary classification. Um, so yeah, so, well, it's actually, uh, so we can see, so the one they do first is a double dense. I didn't come up with that name. So here, no, notice that they just have, this is, now they have sort of two dense units, dense layers after their, well, yeah, they have 128 dense units, but uh, densely connected units. Um, right, so, so this would be a double dense model. Um, what is the benefit it, of that, do you know? I mean, you know, more, I mean, so if we look at this, um, I mean, yeah, it's more parameters, All right? It's gonna take a second to run. Um, but so, I mean, notice that, you know, when we add the second dense layer or, you know, fitting, you know, 4,160 new parameters so it can learn more things. Um, so you get representations at this level, um, now, this is really this is unfortunate. They, they mentioned in the book that these uh, layers get suffixes and they can be random and that we shouldn't interpret them. In this case, um, they, they somehow did a reverse ordering where they go four, three, two. Um, anyway, but the point is that, um, yeah, you, we just have more, we can learn more things. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rerun this. So there's also, um, so the, here's another thing they can do. We can, uh, instead of having another dense layer, um, we can have another convolutional layer. So notice here, after the embedding of the words, uh, we, we pass them through a convolutional layer and pooling, and then we do another convolutional layer and we pool. And this is something they talk about um, in the book without, I don't think really explaining uh, here. Well, here's the explanation. I don't know if it will help anyone, um, but oh, the fact that, Thing I'm trying to point to toward is that they have 32 filters in the first pass, and then they have 64 in the second. And um, so they, they write, um, this model is using an increasing number of filters in each layer, doubling the number of filters for each layer. Um, this is to ensure that there are more filters later on to capture enough of the global information. So that is, not a super rigorous, I mean, sure, more filters, more information, more parameters, I mean, but anytime you have more parameters, it's more information. It, you know, but that explanation, I feel like could justify the opposite ordering, maybe, I, I don't, um, I, I don't know. Again, I'm gonna say that the book just isn't finished. Um, and then, okay, and so all this code I'm skipping over not running is just the fitting of the model because each time we fit, as just a reminder, we first have to determine the architecture, uh, and then we compile the model, um, you know, by setting optimizer, loss, and metrics, and then uh, we actually fit the model. And and here they're going to do like prediction stuff with their validation sets so that we can compare all of them. Um, and so I'm just going to skip to that real quick. Um, and so that's what well. There's this function, blah, 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 and we get these predictions. 
at the individual level, but if we look at them um, here, we can see how the three models perform. So again, we fit three so far. We have the one that has a, a convolutional layer followed by a dense layer, and then we have the double convolutional, and then we have double convolution and then the double dense. And uh, kind of sadly, um, their performance is basically the same. I mean, uh, again, I guess in, in neural network, in AI world, there's actually a big difference between 77% and 78%. So I guess I shouldn't say that they're not that different, but uh, they seem to the uninitiated, not that different. Um, so now, um, even though we really haven't explored the, the different ways you can, uh, the different genres of, of scene and architecture in the book, uh, they just start talking about other stuff. <laughs> no, um, but I think actually maybe the more interesting things in the chapter are the stuff that is actually has nothing to do with CNNs per se. So, um, yeah, it's just while, while I'm opining about the opining about the book, it is an interesting thing where like each method that's not about tokenization will usually have an interesting new tokenization method that was not covered in the tokenization chapter. Chapter. So um, in this chapter, there uh, like ha like hashing was introduced in some chapter that was not tokenization, even though that's a way of of you know processing the data. Okay. Um, in any case, so they're going to bring up uh, byte pair encoding. So okay, where to begin with this? So I guess I'll start with my first bullet point. So um, it's a way of doing subword tokenization. And so just uh, like, like well, what is that about? So remember that the most basic tokenization um, algorithm is just to split on white space. So you see a piece of white space, you say end of that token that was before, start of the new token. And then when you come across white space again, you, you know, do a little snip and, and that's the token. And then we can sort of skip over we can say you have like a budget of one white space and then so you do word white space that's in the budget and then you get to another white space and then you do the snip and that would be bigrams right and so on for trigrams and whatnot so that would be multi-word tokenization so subword is a way of getting inside words so now we're looking like inside white space splits uh, and tokenizing uh, so so this is one way of doing subword tokenization and it originated not in natural language processing, but as a compression algorithm uh, by a person who I uh, never heard of. Um, Gage, 1994 is the, the citation. Um, and in the end, what we're going to get is uh, this is just a throwback to like you know back when they were talking about semantics, syntax, and uh, morphology um, being the different sort of well, they're, they're different areas of linguistics. Um, anyway, so morphology is, as a reminder, like the looking at the building blocks of, of words. So um, I guess, so earlier I was using the word complexify. And, you know, when you, um, you, you hear complexify, for example, I, I don't think it would be a word in a dictionary, but nevertheless, you know what it means because it's, because you're basically both of you uh, and, and anyone watching this video, uh, it has internalized English morphology so that you know that complex, you can, without even thinking about it, right? You just know that complexify is, um, comes from complex, which in this case is an adjective, and ify, right? Um, which is, uh, which maybe you don't think about, but it is something that can turn uh, an adjective into a verb, right? Um, so but like, like, I don't know if I were like a, a dad or something and like um, I had this cup, right? And I was like, and there was some coffee over there. I could be like, hey, can you cupify that coffee? And I think, again, you would get some people rolling their eyes, but, um, but it would be understood, you would, you would understand it. Anyway, so that's just morphology right there. Suffixes, sort of root words, but also prefixes sometimes, um, other, other stuff. But so, 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 okay, so morphology is a linguistic term, but this algorithm, it has no linguistic knowledge. So it's sort of um, from the bottom up, 
just looking at uh, adjacent, in our case, letters, not, not always letters, it can be spaces, it can be uh, punctuation marks too, but it looks at adjacent um, characters and starts building them up, saying, seeing which ones co-occur and grouping them together in a recursive algorithm that is, is just gonna be easier to see if I show you the results of doing it. But I did, I, I've linked to, uh, there's a paper that's good on it. And then there is a nice GitHub uh, library that is the, sorry, GitHub page for the library that um, the tokenizers um, uh, package uses. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip over this. These are some kind of convenience functions. Um, Go ahead. So this um, chapter O, is it also CNN or they are just um, trying to introduce something? Because I think I'm looking at this as text. So what's the relationship um, with the CNN here? Yeah, there's no, no relationship. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th this is, I mean, you know, I, I guess I'm an opinionated uh, per person, but this is definitely something that should have been in the tokenization chapter, uh, but. Exactly, it, yeah, yeah, got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, anyway. Um, so, so we can look at something like this. Uh, it will appear, hopefully. I'm glad it did. I'm, I'm not really sure about this, this X axis. Um, in any case, hmm, there must be some like invisible outlier somewhere. Uh, uh, so, so we can look at, um, I don't know if you can paint words. So there are these distributions of number of subwords. So, I mean, okay, that's so Y axis as with all histograms is basically counts or density. In this case, it's counts, but you could think of as density. Um, and then, so, and then this is our, so, so notice that we've done, okay, I should, okay, I should actually explain some things. So when we give different vocabulary sizes, um, which means basically how many things we want this algorithm to extract, right? So we can, we can say basically extract 2,500, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, um, we get these different distributions of subwords per campaign blurb. Um, so I'm trying to think about how to put this um, because this is going this is of necessity. This is going too fast. So, um, you know, it's straightforward how many words, well, it's more, it's relatively straightforward how many words are in any given campaign blurb, especially, or how many like unigrams. Uh, that, that can be defined very rigorously, again, if we use the white space criterion. Um, and that can be, yeah, at least it can be unambiguously determined how many tokens there are. Um, but so this algorithm, again, like I said, it's, it's recursive. So we can determine basically like how many tokens in its dictionary we want it to have. And so that's what we're looking at here is we're treating that because it is a hyperparameter. So we're looking at, as, as we say, you know, we want the algorithm to get 2,500, we want the algorithm to get 5,000. Um, that's gonna change when it processes the, the blurbs, it's gonna change how many subwords are in each blurb. Because again, these are things that we're creating. So it's an interaction between something that we've input, that we're imposing on the blurb and the blurb itself. Um, Perhaps one interesting thing to note is that as we allow it to create more uh, subwords, um, so as it as the dictionary gets longer, right? So it's building up bigger and bigger words as it goes through, and so that's why this distribution moves over to the uh, to the left. So you know here we have you know a very small amount of the tail, but a visually present amount of the tail above 50 for uh, when we set it at 2,500. And then that basically disappears starting here. I mean, there's like a little speck, but then it's, there's really no mass at 10,000. And then uh, here there's actually not a big change. The distribution just becomes a little bit more peaked uh, when we get to 20,000. Okay, and so via some visual voodoo that I, they don't explain, uh, they say 10,000, they just choose 10,000. 
Um, so they choose this here. And then a sequence like the 40, again, they don't say why. Um, and one thing that I thought would make sense is, and again, um, I'm trying to think how much context to give. So in previous weeks, we've talked about this trade-off between um, if you lengthen the sequence length, because the, I guess further back context, for these deep learning models, um, each blurb has to have the same length. So that, that's gonna result, be, but because they're not in the natural world of the same length, that's gonna result in cutting off ones that are too long and using zero padding for ones that are too short. Okay. So, um, but it would be nice, you know, like if the world were such, were arranged in such a way that they all had the same length, like that would be great. Like we don't even have to think about that trade-off, but because the world's not that way, we do have to think about the trade-off. So the one thing that made sense to me was, um, you know, the further these things are distributed, the, the wider the variance here, uh, the worse it is for us, because that means that there are going to be bigger cut off, like, you know, there are going to be more things being cut off on one direction or more things zero padded in the other direction. So what we want is we kind of want a tight distribution. Uh, and the 20,000 actually has the tightest distribution. So that's one argument in favor of the 20,000. But it could be the case that once we start having that many subwords, then we get relatively infrequent subwords and something, something, and who knows. So it's not, anyway, it would have been a good thing for them to discuss, but maybe the book's not done. Um, okay, so all of this uh, code is um, just fitting the model. So it's, well, first pre-processing the data, then you know declaring the architecture, compiling, again, a lot of repetitive code, but that's what copy and paste is for. Um, and let's see what I want to do. Uh, basically, what we're going to see is that uh, it it doesn't do particularly well. Um, it does it does as well as the okay models we've seen before. Um, I think what's more interesting, because again, this really isn't anything about uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, it's more about the byte pair encoding. Um, is to actually look at like what things it created. Um, so this is for some reason taking longer than it should, but what it will ultimately do is extract the step that, extract the tokenizing step um, from the recipe. And there we go. And it's gonna get all the words that start with H. So, so these are tokens that uh, appear that have been created. So we have, notice that H stays in the data, but anytime H is next to, an A, okay, that's not, that's not quite true. But so if the H is followed by an A, it would at least be compounded into an HA. But for example, then if HAB is present, so if B comes after A, then that would be uh, made into HAB, whereas, you know, if it's HAM. So we start to get these things, um, but then we get words that are recognizable, like hand, uh, he, um, head, heart, heast. If anyone can explain what heast might be, I would be very interested. Um, but one interesting thing is that, so, so notice that these in some cases are subwords. Um, and so, so that, that's, that's the idea is that these are like structures that have been, have been taken out of the data. Um, so, and just to be clear, so uh, you'll notice that these, you know, they all some kind of like mid length words. Mm, again, it's probably gonna take a while to, to render for some reason, but um, it has extracted words or subwords that are a very different lengths. So what I'm gonna do here is show you the longest words and then I'll show you the smallest words. So here we have, you know, it's, it's got, it found interdisciplinary singer songwriter, found singer songwriter first with a dash and then with a um, uh, slash. Uh, and it found, you know, environmental. So it, it found some pretty big words, right? And okay, I'm not gonna print this, um, but it also found a lot of single characters. Uh, I'll print this and I'll start talking about something else and we'll see. Okay, another thing that has uh, nothing to do, <laughs> another thing that has nothing to do with convolutional neural networks is uh, explainability. Explainability, another thing that uh, this doesn't recognize, by this I mean our markdown doesn't recognize as a word, but we do because we have morphological knowledge. 
Um, okay, so here are some uh, small token things. Uh, so we have just, we have an apostrophe there. We have apostrophe comma is represented, you know, uh, apostrophe period. We have a lot of dash um, numbers. I'm not sure what that's about, um, but we have a lot of these. So anyway, there's that. Okay, so moving on to things that have nothing to do with convolutional neural networks. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're, we're gonna look at um, how to explain. Okay, so what was the context for this basically? Um, and all the, are all these links. Um, the context for this um, is that neural networks have the reputation of being black boxes, of being able to, uh, you know, you can predict with them, but you can't really explain with them. Um, and that's that's a key difference between a neural network and like a parameterized machine learning model or just a, just a regression or something. So um, there's this package, uh, LIME, uh, which stands for, it's an acronym for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations, which is, uh, I'm glad they came up with it. I'm glad that they came up with the acronym. Um, so it's a way of putting a, a case through the model and sort of some of these papers are really useful, but like basically looking at similar cases and seeing like which part of the case you're putting through changed its, in this case, classification. So, um, we don't have much time to go over it because there's one other section past this that's actually back to related to CNNs. Um, but so if we take, let me look for where I got the sentences. Okay, so if we just take out two random sentences, um, for example, this funding is essential, which is missing an S, uh, to completing a graduate thesis about the potential uh, for ecotourism to protect rainforests in Guyana. Uh, there's one, here's one, I want to record an album and music videos. It's been my dream, blah, blah, blah. Um, so pretty different, pretty different uh, pitches there. Um, so we, we can take these sentences and then, you know, there's um, some boilerplate code where we have a create a explainer object. Um, and so we do these things. Um, again, this code will be, well, it's in the, it's in the book. Uh, and then we actually run the function explain um, we get something, well, we get a big data frame that's not going to be super helpful, but there are all these utility functions uh, in the line package that end up giving you GG plots that look something like this, um, where um, it tells you what the, the true label was, the probability that it would, had that label, and basically whether or not feature, which again, in our case is words, because now we've, we've ditched by parent coding. So, so we're looking at these and whether or not it supports that classification or it contradicts that, in this case, classification. So whether it increase the probability or decrease the probability uh, that it got into the class that it was ultimately assigned. So, um, so I mean, that's what we get. And then there are different ways, there are different functions where we have, now we have one that is, this one's kind of cool. Um, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it's, I think pretty much, if you want to look at the sentence uh, as it was originally constructed, that's nice. In this one, obviously um, the bar graph, the columns, you know, they encode much better, uh, you know, the degree to which it supports like the weight, right? This is not at all encoded here, it's just, the binary, whether or not it's supported or contradicted. Um, and this is gonna probably cause something to crash, um, but there's like an HTML widget that you can do. So I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. Now, one nice thing um, is that you can create fake sentences, and these are ones that they have in the book, um, and put those through your model and see how the model would react to those. And the one thing that they point out um, is, a non-linearity, um, and what I mean by that, I just mean that, um, oh, oh no, I have to run this again. Um, so basically that the same word can have different effects depending on its context. So, um, so notice here, oh my gosh. Okay, so this is, 
Interesting. So, so this changed since last time we ran it. But so in one case, family was red. And in the other case, family was blue. So in one case, it contradicted the classification. In the other one, it supported the, uh, the classification. Uh, but it depended on whether or not it had hole in front of it, or at least that appeared to be the, the reason for that. So, uh, so sometimes we'll see that. So anyway, in this case, uh, I guess that did happen with four in this case. Um, so, so yeah, so you notice that four switches from supporting to uh, contradicting, although um, the ultimate prediction was is very similar here. So that must've been a very minuscule shift. All right, um, just real briefly, uh, I wrote, this is about to get intense. So, um, you know, neural, neural networks have, have hyperparameters. Uh, and one thing that we haven't talked about really so far is how to find the best ones. So, you know, back in uh, the previous chapters, we would do like uh, create a tune grid, a tuning grid of different hyperparameter combinations. And then um, for each of those combinations, do five fold or 10 fold cross validation and see which hyperparameter combination was the best. And that's been absent up to now. Um, so regardless of what type of neural network you're doing, you can have these. Again, this isn't a convolutional neural network topic. This is a neural network topic. It's really just a machine learning topic. Um, but because of the nature of neural networks and the Keras, uh, Keras package, it, it's different. Like the way to do hyperparameter testing is different. Uh, and we need this TF runs package which just in case you're wondering what that is, that the TF is TensorFlow. Um, and so, so this is not something that you would run in R. This is the, notice I call it contents R file. So you would create an R file, like a .R file that has this code. And you create these flags um, and there's information about exactly like what the syntax is here. Um, and then, I mean, this is all very, very similar. Um, and you have a particular output, but then you give it this, instead of like a tuning grid, well, or the way that you give it a tuning grid is in a list where you say kernel size and uh, stride. So these are gonna be the combinations here. Uh, notice that notice that they were passed as strings earlier, right? So kernel size one, strides one. Uh, and so we're gonna you know, try kernel of three with a stride of one, a kernel of three with a stride of two, kernel five, stride one, two, and so on. Uh, strides, something we, uh, we didn't talk about earlier. Um, when, a, when the filter or the kernel convolves over the image, um, if it goes in sequence, right? Not skipping anything, it has a stride of one. If it like skips over a pixel or a word in our case, um, it would have a stride of two and so on. Uh, and anyway, uh, this takes a while to run. So I'm sorry, I already ran it, um, but this is the code. We do a tuning run. We tell the file, the .r file, which again, contains all this stuff. Um, and we create a directory. So it's gonna actually modify files on our hard drive. And then we pass it the hyperparameter. We get this here. And, uh, and then there's a, we can make it a tibble, blah, blah, blah. And we basically, and we get this thing that we're very familiar with where we have uh, the, validation accuracy, and then we have the particular hyperparameters that led to that. And then here it's just organized such that it's decreasing validation accuracy, which puts our, our best model on top. And uh, and yeah, let's see, what model was this? This was a one-dimensional. So it had one convolutional layer and then one dense layer. So it's the first model, basically, um, but with different kernel sizes and different strides. and. Anyway, that's that's the end of the useful stuff they do. They have a cross validation section, which isn't super useful, and then they have a the full game section, which is usually how they end chapters. But they don't really do anything different. They're just gonna. The only difference is basically that they evaluate the model on the test data. That's the only thing they do differently. So it's just a lot of code. Um, but there's some useful links that I've put at the bottom of this page, and that's it. That's it. That's that's the chapter. Long ride. So now we're text masters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, wow. We come to the end of the book.
and uh, we see the part two of the book is coming. <laughs> Wait, what? All right. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, thank you, Leila, for taking this long uh, to cover the oh, book. Leila, you're uh, muted. What did you just say, Sean? <laughs> is there a part uh, two? Is this a... Is that real? No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I don't know, like, the structure of the book, like, it looks like no final. I mean, the way it is. Mm. Uh, what do you think, Justin? Well, I, I'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt. So that's why I think it's not finished. Um, but I don't know, like, I, I don't know the authors. I don't follow their moves. So I, I genuinely have, don't know. I like the yeah. book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much for um, uh, following all along. And uh, we see in another book club. Um, thank you, Justin. <laughs> thank you, Lella. Um, yeah. Nice to go all along from the beginning to the end. Thank you all. This was, this was a good book club. <laughs>